What are the five songs that change your life? For the Love of God I, by Steve Vai, I think would be the first one because that was the first time I can really remember a guitar just singing and speaking like, you know, we discussed earlier, just the way that Steve Vai speaks and tells stories through his guitar is, is everything. Um, Pull Me Under is not my favorite Dream Theater song, but it, I think it was the first one I heard. So probably very life changing there. Same thing with um, uh, Cloud Connected by In Flames. Again, not my favorite In Flames song necessarily, but the first one I remember hearing um, and was just so, so, so life changing. Um, by that same token, probably Slaughter of the Soul by At the Gates, because that was like my first exposure to that sort of heavier, you know, heavier side of like faster melodic death metal. Um, Oh, and then the last one um, would probably be Poison by Alice Cooper, because while it wasn't one of the early songs that I learned, it was a big formative song for me because that was my uh, rock star movie moment. Like I used to be in like an 80s cover band playing Bon Jovi songs and White Snake songs and, you know, Poison songs. And we used to play Poison by Alice Cooper in like this little bar band. And the first time I stepped on stage with Alice and played Poison with him was like, that was the moment of like in, in the movie Rockstar when he's like, you know, I'm just a regular guy that grew up with pictures of these guys on the walls and now I'm one of them. Like exposing yourself to an entire new audience of people is extremely strategically a good idea. Like you, you're, you're just expanding your universe like exponentially. Like I'd be like, I'd be curious how many people go to an Alice show and a Demi show. Like you're like, you're touching, like, it's really smart. Like, do you, yeah. Do you want to do, do an Alice Cooper? Do you want to be larger than life forever and do this, this whole thing? Like. I, I do. And yeah. I love it. I can't, I can't imagine I've been doing this my whole adult life. You know, like if you think about doing something since you're 15 and being 35 years old, like what else am I going to do at this point? <laughs> you know, like I think I'm in it, you know, um, and I, I don't just want to be one person's guitar player my no. whole life. I just want to be me and do my thing and play with different artists and explore my possibilities, you know, and and enjoy it enjoy it while i have the opportunity because the opportunity is here now hi welcome to the revolver fan first podcast i'm your host christina rowett and joining me today is a guitar legend a shredder icon nita strauss how are you going today i'm so good thank you so much for having me on well it's great to have you here it's you know it's an exciting time it is, is. yeah new frontiers and stuff. yeah so um, now we this um, shows all about your history as a fan. So first question we always ask is, who was the first artist you put on a pedestal? You know who it was? Kitty. Really? Kitty. Yes. Um, if I thought about it, I could probably think of some others, but the first one that popped into my head is Kitty. And I'll tell you why. Because I was a metalhead kid without a lot of females to look up to in the kind of music that I liked. And Kitty was the first all-female band that I ever heard of, like the first all-female metal band that I ever heard of. It was the first album that I saved up and bought with my own money was Spit by Kitty. Um, and yeah, it, that was the, you know, I just thought it was so cool that there was a group of girls out there crushing it, playing heavy music and kicking ass. That's That's a pretty important thing. There is that theory, you've got to see it to be able to be it. Was that like a moment where you kind of, yeah. That I would early? definitely, yeah, oh, yeah. Well, you know, it was. It's interesting. You know, we talk a lot about representation in this day and age. You know, and while I don't necessarily think you need to have a hero that looks like you in order to have your aspirations and your dreams, now you have one. You know, like now everybody has a hero. Like I remember, you know, it was Kitty and it was Jennifer Batten playing with Michael Jackson. You know, like were such huge moments for me. And like, while I was listening to, you know, In Flames and At The Gates and, you know, there's no girls in any of those bands, um, I was still seeing girls in the field that I wanted to be in kicking ass. And it was really, really inspiring for me. That's awesome. Oh, I'm, I'm glad to see it. It's exciting. It's good. It's yeah. good to have everyone, everyone be a part of it because the crowds, are, the crowds are mixed. It should kind of go both ways, you know, it's yes, a whole, exactly. yeah, it's a whole thing. I mean, so talking about, um, these these sort of moments, I guess. 
playing with Alice Cooper for eight years, mm-hmm. what kind of picture did you have in your head of him at this point when you were a kid? Because you've you've been you've been touring since you were fifteen, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. that's wild. Yeah, yeah. So um, who, who was yeah. who was Nita when yeah when you were like a young teenager? And um, yeah, what was your impression of kind of big, larger than life characters like that? Um, it's it's always so interesting thinking about where I thought my trajectory was going to go as a young artist. You know, you never really imagine yourself playing in other people's bands. You know, as a young musician, you write your own songs, you go on your own tours, you go out and do your own thing. And then when I was uh, 18 or so, you know, I was finishing up high school and I realized I just wanted to play guitar. I didn't really care who I was playing for and what I was doing. I just wanted to go out there and play. And if you would have told me I would end up with someone like Alice Cooper or someone like Demi, it would have blown my mind, you know, because I just wanted to go out there and play guitar with anybody that would have me on their stage. And my first, my first exposure to Alice Cooper, like so many people, of course, was Wayne's World. Um, you've got the shirt. Oh, you're we're got it. Yeah, we're repping. So. We're repping. Yeah, we're... <laughs> um, And, you know, you hear of all of these stories about Alice, um, and I'm here to tell you they're all true. He is really the nicest person in all of rock and roll, the consummate professional, um, never, ever has a bad show, never has a bad day. um, And all those things that I heard about him all those years were totally true. Awesome. Well, did he explain anything to you about this lifestyle that no one explained better? I wouldn't say necessarily that he explained it as much as he just leads by example. Yeah. You know, he leads this band and crew by the example of how he is as a human being. He treats people well. He treats people with respect. He treats fans with respect. Um, No one has a bad Alice Cooper story. And I love that. That's a a very important thing. I mean, you, you have like, You must have an incredible relationship with your fans. I mean, you like crowdfunded your debut album to 800%. Like that's a pretty clear example of the connection you've built with your fans. How, yeah. I mean, how did that, how did did that all come together? And I, yeah, I've heard the new single. It's killer, dude. You're a shredder. Like it's mental. Yeah. Thanks. It's great. I'm so glad you have this, your own sound as well as, you know, lending your talents to others. (laughs) I am too. Yeah, it's sick. it's it's not going to change anytime soon. You yeah. know, I've I have needed a creative outlet for my own music the whole time. You know, I've I've been touring with other artists, you know, whether I'm playing Iron Maiden songs, whether I'm playing Jermaine Jackson songs or Alice Cooper songs or Demi Lovato songs, you always need to have your own creative outlet to express yourself. And, you know, I'm I'm not planning on slowing that down anytime soon any more than I would have last year or the year before or any other time. Sick. Well, it's great. It's great to hear. So what was the big catalyst for making this leap? So you're now playing with Demi Lovato's band in an all gold band. She's getting back to her metal roots, um, allegedly. That's the word on the street. Um, <laughs> yeah. What are you most excited about? I mean, you're kind of going back to the kiddie thing, really. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's it's funny thinking about that because yeah. now it's a badass all-female band yeah. you know, in an unexpected avenue, breaking down some barriers, breaking down some major stereotypes. Uh, I hadn't made the kitty connection until this this conversation that we're having, but it's pretty fucking <laughs> cool, you know? Like, um, the band is phenomenal. You know, the, the players, Britt Bowman playing drums, Leanne Bowes on the bass, Danny McGinley on the keys. Demi is such a powerhouse vocalist and a great performer. Um, the fans are absolutely the most passionate, diehard, loving supportive group of people that i have ever been around wow. uh, so it's, it's just a recipe for awesomeness that's beautiful what's a beautiful thing yeah it is a beautiful it's a thing you know, yeah I, i've been thinking about this a lot you know because we've been have on this roller coaster of the last few weeks and um i think about demi's fans quite a bit uh, because demi made this huge shift in her musical style And her fans could have very easily, you know, taken up the pitchforks and said, no, stick to pop, you know, like we like you for who you, what you were doing and we want you to stick to what we like. Um, But her fans have overwhelmingly embraced this, you know, and said, yeah, rock it out. This makes you happy. We're happy. We want to buy tickets. We want to buy records. We want to see it. And it's just, 
it's beautiful. It's beautiful yeah. to be embraced by this new group of people. It's beautiful to see it happening for Demi, who absolutely deserves it as an artist. So it's it's been it's been a fun time. Well, it's kind of a part of a. It, I mean, it could be a part of a shift. I mean, it's like hip hop's been the dominant force for like a really long time in like popular culture, and I feel yes. like everyone's kind of revealing they're a secret metalhead. It's, it seems yeah. to, you know, it's kind of coming out a bit. I feel like there could be a bit of a resurgence. Like, I don't know what it's going to take to do that, but it, it's interesting to see. Yeah. What's your perspective? I mean, you're actually out there on the road. You're seeing this all happen. So what's, what's your vibe? Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. totally agree with you. And how exciting to be a part of that. Like how cool, you know, like I've been in the rock world a long time. I've paid my dues. I've got my street cred. You guys know you know, hopefully by now that like, I'm not in it for the money. I'm in it because I love it. And I've been doing it all this time. Like how cool for me and Britt and Leanne and Danny and Demi and all of us to get to be in on the ground floor of what could be this huge surge of rock music coming to the forefront, you know, bringing live guitars, real drums, you know, real musicianship back to the forefront of mainstream music. I mean, who wouldn't want that to happen? That you know? is kind of awesome when you put it that way. And we kind yeah. of need some fresh blood. And we need some young Absolutely. we need some young headliners as well. Like headline the headliner world is dominated by a certain like it it takes a lot to break into the headliner ranks and you're Absolutely. kind of yeah and you're and not that you should own it, right? But it yeah, it is a child. We do have a we need to have a changing of the guard and we need to, you know, you know. New, yeah, new it should to, be yeah. done by somebody who authentically wants to do it. Yeah, you know, like, this is not a situation where a label is saying, "Hey, you know what? I think we'd sell some records if you completely change the style that made you as huge as you are and, and start playing rock." Yeah, you know, be fun. Somebody, yeah. yeah, this is somebody who you know. You ever listen to Demi do interviews and they ask about some favorite bands and she's talking about Job for a Cowboy, you know, like Maylene and the Sons of Disaster. You know, this is this, this is, is not legit. the. the yeah, it's not the talk of somebody who's been told to say what their favorite bands are. I mean, no label is going to go out and name Abigail Williams as a band that you're supposed to be throwing out there, you know. Yeah. So um, it's it's just cool. It's just it's been great. It's been good to be a part of, you know, it's it's been a, and we haven't even started the real tour yet. We start the tour on Saturday, you know, day yeah. after tomorrow. So That's exciting. Holy very exciting. God. So tell us a bit about your relationship with the guitar. Like what made you fall in love with it? And did, were you always like good with your hands or like, I know that's a weird question, but yeah. No, you're it's a very, not. you're a I mean, killer guitar sense. player. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So it's interesting that you say that specifically, because my mom, um, when I was growing up, my mom was a dancer, um, ballerina and uh, modern dance. And she now teaches handwork. She teaches uh, sewing and knitting and that kind of thing. And she has said to me so many times, I find it so interesting that you are a professional musician because you were never really like one for the fine motor skills, you know, like the delicate, you know, I can't draw, I can't paint, my handwriting is atrocious, like I can't make small stitches, you know, like I, I can't do any of the other fine motor skill things, but somehow my fingers work in that way. Um, so while my mom was th that, my dad is a musician. And my dad is the one that got me my first guitar, just sort of instilled that love of music in me, took me to my first shows and all that kind of stuff. So I feel like a good mix now of my two parents. Awesome. What was your first concert? It was, um, well, I saw some like small club bands in LA and then my first big show that I went to was Anthrax and Judas Priest. <laughs> nice. Yeah. <laughs> that makes um, sense. That, yeah, that makes sense. That adds up. That adds up. That's a nice trajectory through to Alice Cooper. Yeah. Totally. That's, that's small logical. Small club bands. Yeah. Anthrax and Judas Priest. Yeah. That, that, there's, it, it just makes sense. It's, it's just common. Did you always feel, I mean, it, it wasn't necessarily like growing up, like when you were a teenager, it was what, like 90s, 2000s and stuff. It kind of, mm -hmm. I mean, was it a metal time? I mean, I, I don't even like looking, I suppose it was like, what do you think the peak, what was the big thing at the time that you were into, do you think? The big thing, yeah. when, I started, when I was learning how to play guitar, it was yeah. Linkin Park. Linkin yes. Park was, was the biggest band in the world. Yeah. Uh, and I remember, you know, Linkin Park, Godsmack, you know, that, like, those kind of, you know, it was like the early 2000s, yeah. you know. Um, and I remember 
I was into, you know, Swedish melodic death metal, you know, I was listening to In Flames and At The Gates and, you know, on the radio was Limp Bizkit and uh, Linkin Park, you know, and, and I remember thinking like, where is all the guitar? <laughs> like, um, but it still was, you know, as a formative time in my life, it's so cool. I remember I thought I was the best guitar player in the world when I learned how to play One Step Closer by Linkin Park, it has that harmonic in the riff. And I was like, I got it. Best ever, like oh, awesome. Yeah. That's a yeah. I mean, it's it's an important like they're an important band, and and it's like it's, sometimes I feel like the two thousands don't get enough credit. Like kind of rock and roll yeah. around that time, it's like the forgotten middle children of rock. Like everyone always talks about like eighties thrash and all this stuff, and like now, but the, there's this huge period. Um, what? Who gave you your first big break? What was what felt like your first big break? Hmm. Um, well, I started out doing DIY touring, you know, mm -hmm. just, you know, going out in a van, going out with my first tour, we actually did in a truck. Nice. Um, and then, uh, and then a van, um, and then different van tours and stuff. Um, first big tour I did, um, as a hired gun was actually playing with a band called the As Blood Runs Black. Um, I did the Never Say Die tour with them. That was my first time overseas. Uh, my first bus tour, that was 2009. And then I went straight from that into Jermaine Jackson's band, Michael Jackson's brother, yeah, wow. uh, in 2010. So talk about a stylistic flip, you know, going from metalcore to like R&B, funk. Um, and I went to Africa with Jermaine Jackson um, playing um, Jermaine's solo music and some Michael Jackson songs as well, because Michael had sadly just passed. Um, then from there, I went and was doing my own thing for a while. Um, I got recruited into the Iron Maidens, um, the all female Iron Maiden tribute band. I played with them uh, 2011 to 13. And then I got picked up by Alice in 2014. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, of course, was with Alice until this last year. Yeah. How did that come about? I don't know. Which, one is, yeah. which one is the, which one is the break? Like, the I don't of, know. I think it's, it's not really so much of a break. As it's like, not really a thing, up. is it? Yes. It's, it's a constant. It's about longevity, really. And you've yes. had longevity and that's what matters anyway. Like this, yes. is a, this is a fairly big. Well, how did you? Yeah. I mean, how do you approach like you're, you know, a big presence on stage? How did how do you shift what you do going from? from Alice to Demi that's a very interesting shift in energy like they both have heaps of energy yeah yes yeah. very much so um I I feel really lucky that when I get hired by different artists they hire me because they like what I do so you there's do. not really yeah they're, they they hire Nita because they want Nita you know and uh I feel like that with sessions stuff like that too I just I'm at this really lucky phase of my career where people like what I do and they get me because of that you yeah, know. That, that's cool. Um, yeah, I, I feel so lucky. So I honestly, my energy hasn't really shifted much at all. You know, I'm I'm playing my same rig, my same guitars, I'm bouncing around, whipping my hair the same way. Uh, the song tempo is a little different, you know, like, um, but we're having fun, you know, we're still, still getting our feet wet. I know at the time that we're recording this, we've just done two warm up shows with Demi and then quite a bit of TV. Um, but we're you know we're feeling out the show but the thing that surprised me the most is it's really not like a regimented pop show it's a rock show and that's that's been really 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 fun what do you mean by regimented like like choreographed sort of thing yeah you know yeah. i was expecting you know you watch old videos of demi's previous tours and there's dancers and there's stage positions and this and that and um i was expecting it to be much more choreographed and it's yeah. really not you know like the choreography in this tour is the same direction as what we had in Alice, which is let Alice be Alice. When it's your turn, you go up and you be Alice. And, uh, that's you know, that's literally, those were literally Alice's words to me. He said, my first rehearsal, he said, when you step out to take that solo, you become Alice Cooper. Um, and I think that there's, you know, as, as the, the hired gun or, you know, however you want to call it, there's that, that learned skill of knowing how to shine and knowing how to let the principal shine, knowing how to let this Alice or Demi, wh whoever it is, you know, let them be there and then be there when you're needed, you know? 
Uh, and it's it's like a dance, you know, and it's not like, Nita, you take three steps forward and the demi will take two steps back and blah, 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 blah. It's just like we interplay off of each other. You get this spatial awareness of being on stage after doing it for a long time where you see someone move forward and you move back and you see someone move to one side, you move to the other side and you fill those holes and you make sure that everybody's not congregated on one side of the stage and then all of the other side has nothing to see. It's just the ebb and flow of a show that just develops over time. That's cool. So you've really refined your stagecraft, you know. I have, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Like you played some big ass shows. Yeah, I mean, what a, like, what a university in performance that you've kind totally. of gone through. And it must, like, you must kind of feel a bit more like, I, I mean, you are just being who you are. Like it must really feed back into making your own music and kind of going, well, this is who I am and, and you know, I'm kind of internalising. Like you must take in a lot from the whole experience. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I do. And I have, um, I've, you know, I've been thinking about this a lot lately. I have kind of a unique perspective on it because I'm constantly doing so many different gigs. You know, this, like in the last six months, I was bouncing the entire time between my solo music and Alice Cooper shows and LA Rams games and NASCAR races and like, you know, so I'm literally routinely, I'll play to 300 people with my solo band. And then the next day I'll play to 70,000 people at a Rams game. And then the next day I'll play to 200 people with my solo band. And then a week later I fly to the UK and I'm doing an arena tour with Alice. Like I'm constantly bouncing back and forth and back and forth. And uh, that's what keeps it fresh. That's what keeps it fun. So it keeps it exciting. And then, you know. What a, yeah. What an amazing, what, do, what are the, what are the three most things, um three most important things a guitarist should learn and the three most important things a guitar should unlearn? Like from a business perspective or from like an actual guitar playing perspective? Whatever perspective. I feel like you have pretty good insight on both. <laughs> yeah. Um, number one, I, I feel like, okay, I'm just going to approach it from like an overall perspective. I think the most important thing is learn how to play well with others. Um, because we as guitar players don't naturally do that. We want to do our own thing all the time. And you have to learn how to work with different artists, especially if you want to be in the hired hired gun world. Learning how to work with different artists, learning how to work with different personalities in the band and crew and all that kind of stuff. Um, time management, be on time, have your stuff learned. Um, and this is for hired or if you're doing your own thing. Um, just have the respect for the people that you're working with to be on time and show up with your parts prepared, you know, don't be learning stuff on the fly or not be prepared when it comes to showtime or anything like that. Um, and be versatile, be able to change things up in a moment's notice, you know, so, uh, sometimes, you know, the artist will say, Hey, I want to drop the song a half step, you know, like my, you know, my throat is sore today, I'm going to play this like this, or we're going to cut this song, or we're going to replace it with something else or whatever. And in that moment, you have to be a pro about it and go, okay, cool. Like be ready to roll with the punches and roll with any changes and not be like, well, I didn't learn that other song or I'm not ready or I think it should be the other way or whatever. Just be able to roll with the punches. Um, and the three things to unlearn, guitar players always think that we know how things should go and we rarely do. <laughs> so unlearn that. <laughs> realize that uh, especially I, I I know that I'm sort of in this hired gun mentality right now but that's where I'm that's where I'm coming from and I think that as much as it is our instinct to say well I know how it should be it isn't always how it should be so unlearn the ego and lean into the humility um same thing with tone I think that we all think that we know how our guitar should sound all the time um and I have been on a tone journey, especially in my new gig of like, hey, you know what, it can't all be high gain, high delay, you know, metal tone all the time. I've been sort of having to lean into these cleaner tones or crunchy lower gain, you know, amp settings that are not my usual thing. And you have to unlearn your need to always sound the same and embrace um, whatever the gig needs. Mm. Uh, final thing to unlearn. I think those were the important ones. They're pretty honest. good. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think if I think of anything else, I'll interrupt you later. That's about <laughs> it. That's about educational. It's okay. Yeah. Who do you think are the guitar players that you think have the best tone? Ooh, Satriani. Yeah. Has yeah? Some amazing tone. I have two different Satriani amps from two different amp companies. Just, just to bounce it out. Yeah. 
Yeah, I have the PV Satriani and I have the Marshall Satriani just because I love Satch's tone for sure. Awesome. Who yeah. um who changed your idea of what music could do? Like what was the first record that kind of came along that changed your idea of what was possible and made it made things yeah, made new things feel possible? Uh Steve Vai. Steve yeah. Vai was the guitar player for me. Um because I just have never heard I had up until that point, I'll say still have never really heard a guitar player make the guitar speak the way Steve Vai does. You know, whether you're thinking about um, like a, a song like Tender Surrender, which is just like such a sexy guitar song, you know, oh my God. Or like, you know, when he's playing Yankee Rose with David Lee Roth and literally having a back and forth conversation, like David Lee Roth is speaking English and Steve Vai is playing guitar and somehow it makes sense um that was that was a moment for me where I was like you can tell a story with this with this instrument I'm I've never been particularly good at putting what I want to say into words like writing lyrics or poetry or anything like that but I have found that I'm good at telling it with the notes of the guitar yeah which is kind of speaks to people on another level it's another form of language like totally it's yeah. it's universal music is is a universal language and it's beautiful because these songs can take on any meaning that you need them to you know there's nothing telling you this song is about that you know this song is about a breakup so you write you listen to a sad guitar song and you're going through a breakup maybe the artist didn't write it about a breakup but it can be that song for you if you need it you know um i yeah. have found that to happen with my songs a lot and i love hearing that what was your soundtrack to you um your the first time you fell in love Ooh. Well, we did listen to a lot of Dream Theater. Yeah. <laughs> it was the one that introduced me. Lauren, they're not Theater. meant to get oh. you. Dream Theater prog fans are meant to be crying at home alone. <laughs> no, we never <laughs> no. need a straw. No, but like legitimately, my yeah. first boyfriend was so into Dream Theater and I was so into Dream Theater. So it was probably like images and words or That's awake. That's sort of beautiful. I think I think you give yeah. hope. To, I think you give hope to prog fans everywhere, really. With the- I will give you a unique answer on that. I, I saw um, I saw a meme the other day. Um, my friend Aol posted a meme on his Instagram that said, uh, "There's a, a a guy an ancient from an ancient tribe that um, has." from an island that has never seen a woman in his life, and then it's like has the um, handshake, and it's like that guy and Dream Theater fans. <laughs> It's a whole thing. So you you have you have. I love Dream Theater, damn it! You're a de- so you're a, you're a prog girl. You get you get. I mean, it makes sense. Patrice, yeah. I mean, he doesn't play around. No, no. no. Oh my god! Talk about tone, John Petrucci. My god, yeah. he doesn't. There's no messing around. So what so else good. are your secret loves? <laughs> secret. Um, well, yeah. What do you obsess well, over? Yeah. Obs- like music wise. Yeah. Uh, okay, well, I'm I'm working on building up my metal cred again right now, oh, yeah. but I will say anyway, I think that Black and Blue by Backstreet Boys is a goddamn masterpiece. And I'll tell you who else agrees with me. Yeah. Every single metalhead girl that I know, everyone, <laughs> Courtney from the Courtney and Nikki from the Maidens, the Butcher Babies girls, Neely Brosh, like every girl in a band that I know loves the Backstreet Boys. That's um. <laughs> that's a hilarious <laughs> that's a hilarious fact well hey you know they've got I'm like fight me got, fight bring, bring it on like bring it on that you know they they made an impact let let's be real yeah so hey, great guitar that? playing listen you listen to that guitar solo yeah. on um larger than life by the backstreet boys shreds your face off i'm not even kidding i don't know who it is on the record i think greg howe toured with them maybe like but it is, I mean, there's some shreddy stuff that's a, in the that's back cool. of the catalog if you listen to it. Are people mad at you for leaving Alice? More mad than I expected. Yeah. <laughs> but here's the thing. Like, they you know, love you. I, that's why. Like, yeah. Totally. Yeah. I, I, you know, and I've, I've tried to clarify this over the last few days a little bit because I think that there was a lot of to do over something that really wasn't as final as the internet made it out to be, you know? <laughs> Um, with Alice's blessing, I took a step back from the fall tour to try something different. You know, I, we hugged it out. He said, you know, his exact words were go and shine your light and have a great time, you know, and, um, there was never like a, I quit. I didn't walk out in the middle of a tour. We've been off the road for two months. They haven't played a show yet. You know, like 
the tour was long over. There was, you know, this, this has been blown up into so much more than it should have been, I think. Um, but it's like you said, it's people care. And I am very honored that people care so much. And yeah, like if they didn't care, they wouldn't be talking about it. If they didn't care about my career, you know, they wouldn't be talking about it. So I, in a way I feel very loved. Well, it's testament to your talent. Like, you know, you can't, if you, if you just, if you just bounce out and everyone's like, yeah, bye, it's fine. Yeah, 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 no, totally. You know, and I will decide if my talents are being wasted or not. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> well, but, yeah I mean, um, the metal fans are, are pretty special, actually. Yes. Yeah. But you know what? Honestly, yeah. the metal community, I stand by it no matter all the heat that I've taken lately. Mm. I have been in this community my whole adult life and I still think they're the best fans in the world I think they're the most so so passionate I know I just said that about Demi's fans but like I will stand by the metal community the most passionate the most you know for the most part supportive and cool like you know how many times have you seen a mosh pit and somebody falls down and there are hands right there to pick them up every single time and I can't fault our community for being the passionate community that it is if a bit gatekeepy at times yeah <laughs> yeah it's, you know. i guess it's a i guess there must be some pushback where they're like why is she get yeah why is demi getting into this this is our world and well like everyone getting mad at people getting into metallica from stranger things from stranger things yeah. isn't it so much better that people are listening to metallica <laughs> this is what i don't understand like what is you know for years and years and years people myself and everybody so many people have thought oh pop music is you know there's no guitar there's no guitar in mainstream music now there's guitar in mainstream music and people are still complaining <laughs> Come on. You know, what is happening but um, again at the end of the day like i i do get it because i've been around our scene for a long time and i i understand the need to protect something that you find sacred yeah so i just hope that in time people can see that this is not an intrusion on our scene. It's just an addition to our scene. Totally. What, um, did you feel like you had to protect the things you loved as a kid or did you have people you got into music with together? Like people you played with, or was kind of metal your own little vision quest? No, um, I got into bands really young. Yeah. Um, you know, I started playing I played yeah. my first show. God, like, I think I played my first show less than a month after I started playing. <laughs> like, I wasn't any good. And I was, in a, I was in like a death metal band. You know, I was like 13, 14 years old. And I lied to them and told them I was 16. <laughs> and like, you know, started playing like sort of underground death metal shows, playing bass because I wasn't good enough at playing guitar to play guitar on stage yet. Um, and I was just soaking up everything that I could get. You know, I was like... I was devouring all the different kinds of metal. I was listening to Burzum. I was listening to At the Gates. I was listening to White Snake. I was listening to like just whatever I could get my hands on to try to understand the spectrum mm. of music of what was out there. And I was like, okay, I went through a you know went through a Norwegian black metal phase, and I was like, I don't really know if this is my thing, you know. Like, and then I and then it's I got nice. more into, yeah. like you know the Carcass and and in flames and like more like the melodic death metal. I was like, this is more my thing. And, you know, it just evolves. And I think, I think that my childhood self would be psyched to hear summer storm. You know what I mean? Like listening to Steve Vai, listening to dream theater, listening to in flames, you know, I think that my childhood self would be happy. You can hear it. Yeah. You can definitely hear it. And well, what's, yeah. What's the plan for your future? Yeah. For your future, like what's next coming um, out from you after summer storm? What's, um, so, what's the plan? Um, yeah, the yeah. first single uh, came out way too long ago. <laughs> that was uh, Dead Inside with David Draymond. Um, and we made a, a really good splash with that. We got to number one at Rock Radio, which was Sick. unbelievable. So cool. Um, Summer Storm, I felt it was important to release that one next because it's a return to my roots. You know, the album is going to be half instrumental, half with guest vocalists. So I felt like it was important to have an instrumental song come out next to make sure that the world knows that I'm not completely abandoning my style. You know, mm -hmm. I think Summer Storm is one of those songs that really encapsulates me as, an, as a writer and as a guitar player. 
Um, and then after that, I'm sure, actually 100% sure, because we already shot the music video. <laughs> uh, the next single will be a vocal one. And then uh, after that, hopefully the album uh, after that. Exciting. Well, it's yeah, very, yeah. like exposing yourself to an entire new audience of people is extremely strategically a good idea. Like you, you're, you're just expanding your universe like exponentially. Like I'd be... Like, I'd be curious how many people go to an Alice show and a Demi show. Like, you're, like, you're touching, like, it's really smart. Like, do you, yeah, do you want to do do an Alice Cooper? Do you want to be larger than life forever and do this this whole thing? Like. I, I do. And yeah. I love it. I can't, I can't imagine. I've been doing this my whole adult life. You know, like, if you think about doing something since you're 15 and being 35 years old, like, what else am I going to do at this point? <laughs> you know, like, I think I'm in it, you know? Um, and I, I don't just want to be one person's guitar player my no. whole life. I just want to be me and do my thing and play with different artists and explore my possibilities, you know, and and enjoy it. Enjoy it while I have the opportunity because the opportunity is here now. Yeah, totally. They definitely are. Well, okay. What are the five songs that change your life? Ooh. I, I literally... I'm drawing a complete brain. I know right I, like draw, I like dropping <laughs> some people like just out of absolutely oh. nowhere to see if, okay. if there's every yeah. chance it will come to you momentarily. Yes, there's always a chance. I believe um, in you. Okay, yeah. so um, For the Love of God I, by Steve Vai, I think would be the first one because that was the first time I can really remember a guitar just singing and speaking like, you know, we discussed earlier, just the way that Steve Vai speaks and tells stories through his guitar is is everything. Um, Pull Me Under is not my favorite Dream Theater song, but it, I think it was the first one I heard. So probably very life changing there. Um, same thing with um, what is that song called? Um, why am I blanking on the name of one of my fucking favorite songs right now? It'll come to you. It'll no, I know. I'm literally singing uh, Cloud Connected by In Flames. Again, not my favorite In Flames song necessarily, but the first one I remember hearing um, and was just so, so, so life-changing. Um, by that same token, probably Slaughter of the Soul by At The Gates because that was like my first exposure to that sort of heavier, you know, heavier side of like faster melodic death metal. Um, Oh, and then the last one um, would probably be Poison by Alice Cooper, because while it wasn't one of the early songs that I learned, it was a big formative song for me because that was my uh, rock star movie moment. Like I used to be in like an 80s cover band playing Bon Jovi songs and White Snake songs and, you know, Poison songs. And we used to play Poison by Alice Cooper in like this little bar band. And the first time I stepped on stage with Alice and played Poison with him was like, that was the moment of like in, in the movie Rockstar when he's like, you know, I'm just a regular guy that grew up with pictures of these guys on the walls and now I'm one of them, you know? So that was, um, that was a big moment for me too. So I'll, I'll pick that's what, that's, that's a sold list. That is, that's a yeah. sold list. Who do you yeah. think, who do you think um, are the most hard work, rocking women in rock and roll? and metal hard working women hard, hardest rocking yeah yeah it's rocking yeah well, it probably goes hand in hand i guess yeah it does um, right? yeah um we did a tour alice and hailstorm in 2019 and oh my god watching lizzie every night in those heels you know like with that guitar like my God, she is a powerhouse, a force to be reckoned with. Um, I have got to give a shout out to my girl, Courtney Cox from the Iron Maidens. Um, just one of the most massively talented players and performers that I've ever worked with. Um, the girls that I mentioned before in Demi's band, Brittany, Leanne, Danny, so beyond talented. Um, my best friend in the whole world is my keyboard player in my solo band, Kat Scarlett. Um, such a phenomenal, talented keyboard player and vocalist. Uh, and honestly, even just after a couple of weeks, I'm going to shout out my my new boss, Demi. She is 
an incredible performer watching her hold these crowds in the palm of her hand and sing these notes and belt the way she does it's it's inspiring awesome that's, that's so many great. i could go there's on lot, and on it's, it's 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 awesome though it's it's just it's i feel like it's yeah it's an inspiring time it's it in, is rock and roll's pretty in, rock and roll's in a pretty interesting place right now don't you reckon like there's so much good stuff yes. happening like yeah. Very, very much so. And and like even in the just in the guitar world, how yeah. exciting, you know. Yeah, Saint what's going Vincent on? And, how do you, you see know, how what are you yeah. excited about right now? In it's guitar just life? so cool, like to see this incredible surge of female guitar players happening, you know, and it's been building and building and building. And I just saw an article that Reverb said um the top selling signature guitars were all by female artists, you know, it's like myself and Lizzie's and St. Vincent's and Erica Wolf, like you know, the signature guitars are flying off the shelf. So, you know, Ibanez has three female signature artists now. It's myself and Laurie Basilio and Yvette Young. You know, Neely Brosh, I just saw her kicking ass with Death Clock. You know, um, who else? I mean, Irene Ketty Kitty, Courtney and Nikki from the Maidens. I mean, the Gretchen men, the list just goes on and on and on. It's a beautiful thing. It is. Yeah, you're actually the second the second woman with the signature guitar we've had on this podcast. I love that. Reba, Ma- Re- Reba Myers from Code Orange. Oh, amazing. You, I love her. I'd I love, love that. to see you guys actually do a guitar duel because your styles are I so, would like, love that. That would be so sick. <laughs> like, yeah, I don't want to, I don't yeah. like to duel. I just like yeah. to jam, but yeah, I would jam. Jam is better. Would, yeah. 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 Let's not make it combative. Yeah. Yeah. Well, here's the thing about the the guitar duel, because I've I've been in these situations with much better guitar players than myself, um, you know, playing with Vi or or Satriani or Paul Gilbert, where like where you're sort of in this cutting heads mode where you're supposed to be dueling. Uh, and they never duel. You know, the the best guitar players I've played with have never tried to outplay me, and which is very generous because they could. You know, like, you know, I was there with, with Steve Vai. I've played um, a Steve Vai song called The Animal with him a couple times, both times for charity. And, or no, once for charity and once um, at an Ibanez event we did together. And both times I'm in his world, I'm with his band, you know, playing his song. Steve Vai could have taken me apart, could have torn me to pieces anytime he wanted, and he never did he is the type of person when you're trading back and forth he listens and he embellishes and then i listen and i embellish and it's more of a dance than a duel you know and uh i have taken that with me when i've gotten to play with great guitar players like that and that's something i want to i want to carry on maybe that's the thing to unlearn don't duel like dance yeah you know yeah. what that yeah. is it i knew we were going to come up with a third yeah. one don't duel unlearn, dance. This, unlearn this need to be in constant competition with anyone but yourself yeah that's that's i think that's a pretty good thing okay um yeah. your musical mount rushmore four faces carved in the stone who Ooh. are they god these are really good um alice cooper yeah for sure um Oh, but the rest are all going to be guitar players. Is that weird? I think I don't. I, to be honest, um, Nita, I don't think it's weird. No, I Steve think Pai, Satriani. <laughs> it's going to be weird if it was just like bass players. <laughs> what am know? I going to do? I'm going to put Ozzy and then yeah. like someone else, like either this that doesn't have any connection with me. Um, Alice, Steve I, Satriani, Jennifer Batten, best band ever. Yeah, that's. <laughs> And then, you know, Jennifer being, um, I think, the the female guitar hero we all needed, Steve I and Satch being the trailblazers that they are, and Alice being Alice because he's the best. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's, yes, you've had quite a surreal time. Really? Yes. Like, surreal is a very like, good word. It's pretty, it, what's your, um? have you ever been super starstruck? Yes. Also Steve Vai. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know everything all roads lead back to steve Vai. all roads lead back yeah. to steve Vai, but yeah. it's a it is a good story um yeah. it's one i've told a lot so i'll make it quick but um i was at generation x with my ibanez guys with you know the group of ibanez AR guys and josh and we were waiting after the show and like steve was gonna come get us it's so cool <laughs> like and we're like waiting and waiting and i was like ah, we should go like i'm not a good waiter i'm very impatient and I was like, we should just go. And Josh is like, wait, Steve Vai is going to come. And I was like, we should just go. And then like the doors, double doors open and like 
through the doors is striding Steve Vine. I was like, oh my God. Like, and uh, he came up to our little group of like six or seven people and he was introducing himself around to the people he didn't know. And he got to me and my little ego was like, maybe he knows who I am. Because at the time I was the only um, female artist on the Ivan's roster. And um, I was like, maybe he knows. And he said, hi, I'm Steve. And I said, hi, I'm Nita. And he said, nice to meet you. And then he moved on to the next person. I was like, oh. Oh. <laughs> oh. And then I went in this little shame spiral of stupid, stupid. Why would you, why would he know who you are? You know? And then Steve, I, my hero turned back to me and he goes, are you, wait a second. Are you Nita Strauss? And I was like, yes, I am. And he took my hand, Christina, like this in his two hands like this. And he said, you say the nicest things about me in all of your interviews. <laughs> You fan, you absolute degenerate fan. <laughs> and I was you like, fan boy. Yeah. Oh, like, and it's true because I do, as you okay. have now seen, like I gush about Steve Vai all the time. Yeah. And like, not weird, just a fan, but like I do aspire to be Steve Vai and Crossroads at all times. Um, and it was just the most, I wanted to sink into the floor and die because like the, the your hero's first impression of you must have a google alert or something yeah. <laughs> you know like oh there's nita again talking about crossroads i love it though um yeah it was really sweet it was it's it was like, not letting you down like the, the no. guy um we had on be real from cypress hill he's like we don't like meeting um like many our heroes because if they suck we're going to like take them out kind of thing we're going to beat yeah. them off and i'm like that's pretty aggressive if you don't want to be right, that's, a that's lovely a mild mannered dude but we don't meet yeah. our heroes because um if they suck it's not going to be okay it's yeah gonna, yeah it's that's um that's how it's going to play out and um yeah that's, honestly yeah like i have said many times anybody who says you should never met, meet your heroes has never met my heroes because i have met all of my heroes and they're all so nice um, the only one I haven't met yet is Ingve, and I think that might break the streak, but I would almost be more disappointed if he was nice. Yeah, he's so, there, there, there. Yeah. I would be fine. If Ingve was rude to me, I would be fine with it. It, it um, would be it would be else it, that I've ever met was nice. It balances out ultimately. Yes. Okay. If you are turning, okay, so this is um this is a new question I'm randomly road testing. Where, who do you turn to at times of rage, joy, and sorrow? Where do you go? What What do you listen to when you're feeling enraged? Um, at all of those times, I don't listen. I play. <laughs> that's good. Every, that's a really good answer. Every single one of those times, and and I have a good reason too, because yeah. I don't like to associate any certain song with any emotion that is going to get stuck with that song. Like if it's a song that I like, I don't want to get it stuck in association with a bad memory, a bad time in my life, or whatever. Um, and me being such an emotional musician and person, um, I, I like to take all of that emotion out in my art and my instrument. So like, if I'm, if I am having a good time, I write a song, like I have a song on control chaos called Alegria, which means joy. Yeah. Um, you know, if I'm having a tough time, I'll write a song like Mariana Trench, which is about pressure, feeling pressure, feeling overwhelmed. Um, I think I write the best stuff when I'm coming from that overly emotional place. That's a way more productive way to do it than most. Yeah, of uh, you know, as it's, an it's artist, part yeah. Of my job. <laughs> yeah. Do you feel like you've like your work ethic is sort of you've always had a good work ethic, and I guess it's kind of a part of what yeah what you do. I yeah. have, yeah. Um, growing up in sports as a kid, you know, I think you learn pretty young, you know what you what you the work that you put in conversely affects what you get out of it you know what i mean Probably. so um i've carried that with me all my life you know same thing with practicing same thing with you know fitness whatever it is you know if i don't do my cardio no one's going to do it for me you know if i don't practice if i don't learn these songs if i don't do anything like that no one's going to do it for me you know so i've just always carried that with me what are you learning right now Demi Lovato songs. Oh yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> What's that like? Um, it's fun. Yeah. You know, um, learning a whole new set list is something I haven't done in a long time. Um, the songs are 
a lot more challenging than I expected them to be in, in different ways. You know, there's, there's not any tremolo picking or, you know, anything like overly complex like that, but um, it's these note groupings and patterns and techniques and stuff like that, that are out of my wheelhouse that I don't normally do. And especially being the only guitar player for the first time, maybe ever, you know, if, wow. you know, if not for a very long time, but possibly ever. I don't know that I've ever been in a one guitar band. I've always had two or with Alice three. Wow. Uh, so it's, it's challenging me in ways that I did not expect. Mm. That's, that's quite a, that's quite a big thing. Yeah. That's quite a big thing. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, and you are guitar. Matter, it's me, you know, yeah. if the subject matter of some of these songs of Demi's is so intense and so heavy, you know, um, the, the ne new single from the album is called 29 and it's about a relationship that she had when she was underage with a guy that was 29. And, you know, the, the intro of, and the first verse of the song is just this clean single note guitar and Demi singing these incredibly emotionally charged heavy lyrics. And like, man, if I mess up one of those notes that takes the listener completely out of that experience, you know, it's not, you're no longer hearing this, you know, this story, you're going, well, that sounded weird, you know? So it's not like having, you know, a big rock show with tons of guitars and everything going on and you can sort of hide little things behind other musicians. It's like, it's clean and it's pristine. And if it's not, everybody hears it because it's just me. Yeah. Yeah. What a cool, bold new step in your like guitar life. That's like, it's awesome, dude. Like it's wild. I'm, yeah. I'm loving it. I really am. So are you going to write, like, how does it work? Like, is it like a long-term thing? Are you guys going to write together or is this kind of see how it goes and we're going to tour for a while and see what happens? I'm sure we'll see what happens. Yeah. Um, you know, her album just came out last week. Uh, yeah, so you know, not going to write in I, next week. I don't week, think yes. there's going to be Touring any writing for a while. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll do this. Um, if there is ever an opportunity to write with her, I would love that chance. Um I have been doing co-writes with other artists um, for my record, and uh, I've really learned a lot about collaborating with other people. Awesome. So um, if that opportunity ever comes up, I would love it. Um, I got the opportunity to do some co-writes with the Alice Band as well for the upcoming Alice record. Um, so I'm, I'm leaning into it. I'm leaning into wherever the journey takes me. I'm not saying no to any anything right now. Awesome. What's your favorite metal record of all time? Oh, just to, um, just to narrow it down, just to, just to ask a ridiculous question. Um, yeah, it is a ridiculous question. It is a ridiculous uh, question. <laughs> that's, that's um, I think that uh, In Flames, Clayman is a perfect record from start to finish. Uh, I don't know necessarily that it's my favorite, but it's the first one I can think of that is like, I don't skip a single song. That's well, a beautiful song. It's Yeah. Yeah. It's a beautiful a record. Album. Yeah. You can't Such mess around album. with it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So good. Stabbing the drama. by soul work. So good. Reroute to remain. Also so good. I mean, there's so many records that are so good, but Clayman's the first one I thought of. Oh, that's beautiful. Well, Colony. So good. Uh. <laughs> what? Um. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's a beautiful place to end. That's a beautiful record to end on. And yes, Clayman. <laughs> yeah. Clayman is where we, where we will end. And that is beautiful. And, yeah, have an amazing time on tour and I can't wait to yeah. hear more songs and keep on kicking ass.